Good evening. It is Wednesday night, and we are delighted you're with us for Bible class. We are still not able to meet in the building together, but we're really glad that you're with us tonight. It is a joy for you to be with us and to us to have this time together. We're talking tonight about continuing our study of Jesus on the cross. Tonight, we're going to get into the last three hours Jesus had on the cross. And as we look at this, one of the things we're going to look at first is going to be the holiness of Jesus and the holiness of God. When you think about the holiness of God, 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and 16 says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, as we look at the story of Jesus on the cross, we're going to see face to face the holiness of God. It's a, not a burden that I'm challenged to be as holy as God is, because that's a burden that none of us could bear, none of us could do that. Acts 15 and verse 10 talks about that. God is, as Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, holy, holy, holy. God is not just law, 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 not just love, love, love. God is God, and I am not. And one of the things we have to remember is that when we start trying to make ourselves like God, it has a real tendency to lessen our faith in God. We cannot and should not try to bring God down to be like us. Everything we do should be trying to lift ourselves up to be with God. And sometimes we try to get these sentimental ideas about God. And today, God happens to be very much in. God's very... He's very popular today in a lot of a lot of people, a lot of things. But the end God, the God that is really popular today, and many times in singing and in song, some of the popular, more popular songs today, is a God that is not a holy God. People today want to to feel God, and tomorrow I'm talking about feelings and how they cannot be a a good thing in our seven o'clock in the morning devotional about. They're not always really a good guide for what we need to do. People today, we need to seek God and listen to God and know God. John 17 and chapter 3. It's not that we need to feel God, that we need to be looking to, to feel God, but that we should know God and want to come to know God and to love God. God, in one sense, as we think about the holiness of God, God does not have a lot of different attributes about him. God cannot be sliced up like a pie. God is not one that's got, this part of me is holy, this part of me is pure, this part of me is, no, God is one thing. God is completely different than idols. Idols are not and cannot be holy, but God is holy. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, he is truly holy. We need to recognize the, the otherness of God. The fact that God doesn't have to live up to a standard. God is the standard of what's right and what's wrong. God is absolute. God is infinite. God is incomprehensible. The fullness of purity that he's capable of having. And it's incapable to see anything else that compares to what God is. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth. We need to live in awe, in wonder of God Almighty. People many times say, well, God's justice demands that God do this, or God must do this. No, folks, that's not right. Nothing and no one can make demands of God. God's being is simply one part. He is not parts working together. He is simply one. As you, you look there at the circle, that's what God is. He is complete. He is whole. God is never at cross purposes with himself. God is never a walking civil war where he's divided against himself. Holiness is the characteristic of God 
that is unique to God and separates him from all the other created beings and all the other alleged gods that exist in the world. That allows God to both withhold his love and to give his love. It's no wonder that the word holy appears in the Bible more than 600 times. Only a superior power can compel us to obey him. In all eternity, nothing has entered God's being and nothing's been removed from God's being. God is truly unchanged and unchangeable. Now to reveal himself, God used many times, use it anthropomorphisms, which is an easy word for some people to say, but basically he expresses his nature in human attributes. Now holiness is his number one nature, his number one attribute, and it's explained by others. First John chapter four and verse eight, God is love, not love, but love is not God. God defines love. Love does not define God. Love cannot make sense apart from holiness. What holiness demands, love provides. If God is only equal to love, then the personality of God is destroyed. All of a sudden, you've got a God that's split up into different parts. And some attributes are different. We see one, this might be God's love, this might be God's mercy, this might be God's patience, or this might be God's holiness. But see, love is something true about God, but it is not God. Holiness must be the, the desire and the business of every Christian. You know, sometimes I wonder why the discussion of holiness has fallen on hard times. It's not, it's not preached about much. It's been Someone said it's been orphaned by the church. There's not a lot of sermons, not a lot of classes, not a lot of books on holiness sometimes. Personal holiness, the way we live as individuals, has become almost obsolete. We don't even many times promote holiness in regards to Jesus. Someone asked, and as I was reading some, to prepare for this lesson, when was the last time you heard a sermon on the holiness of Jesus? Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. See, if I want to be holy, I've got to be like Christ. The Christian is not ruined by living in the world, but a Christian becomes ruined by allowing the world to live in him. Holiness is not what only what God gives to me, but it's what I manifest in the life that God has given to me. Holiness has become, needs to become in my life a practice, a position, a process. Many times people today want to exchange holiness for a cheap, false spirituality. Spirituality is not something that can be, or is, is something that can be faked or bragged about, but holiness cannot. Humble people, for example, deny their humility. In contrast, many people go to great lengths to promote their spirituality. Heard of a preacher one time that said, a woman came to me and she said, I'm on a higher spiritual level than you are. He responded by saying he gave her two answers. Number one, I hope you are. Number two, how do you know that? See, without holiness, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 says, we cannot see God. We're to perfect holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1 says. See, we can't appreciate or accept grace until we understand wrath. The question really needs to be, as we look at the holiness of God, is not can how, not how can a loving God send a sinner to hell? But the true side of it should be, how can a holy God not? send a sinner to hell. We're going to look tonight at the holiness of God exemplified on the cross in Jesus Christ. We're going to look at those final three hours on the cross. If you think about six hours on the cross, what great suffering it was and what it brought to the world, 
without Jesus suffering on the cross, you really can't understand Pentecost. But that's really the only way you can understand Pentecost. 3,000 baptisms took place in Acts chapter 2. On that day, people all over the world that had come to Jerusalem with no intention of changing what their beliefs were, with no intention of becoming Christians, with no intention of certainly of following an unknown preacher, Peter. He wasn't even a rabbi. He didn't even know that he was going to preach. He came that morning without something many of us as preachers would have to take a deep breath to do. He came without notes. He came without being even bringing his Bible. Nevertheless, his response that morning, the response to that sermon was the greatest in all of history. The most marvelous thing ever produced, the church, was accomplished on the cross. See, Jesus left nothing to chance. He was in complete control as he went to the cross. We talked about that last week. Thousands of Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Passover, and it was a pilgrimage of a lifetime for many of them. Many of them remained in Jerusalem for 50 days until Pentecost. Those people were crowded close together. There wasn't any social distancing going on there. All the talk was about the Passover and about that empty tomb. They'd never been to a Passover like this before. You see, God gave those Jews 50 days to think about what happened. You remember back in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51 to 53, those Jews that had their teeth rattled by earthquakes, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, God had sent darkness over the face of the earth. Matthew 27, verse 45. God had allowed people to crucify Jesus, but he refused to allow them enjoy, to enjoy seeing him die. The time on the cross was a, an eerie time, a weird time, a spooky time, if you will, a scary time for those people there. Those people must have been too scared to move, too afraid not to move, though. Don't you know they must have been asking the question, what have we done? The rocks were split open. The grave, the tombs were open. Folks that came from the grave were, were recognized by people and appeared to many people as the they were serving in the temple, the priest were. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The euphoria that had been, oh, crucifying, crucifying, all of a sudden now that euphoria has turned into hysteria. People were so scared they were smiting their breast. They were, they were scared. Even that Roman centurion in Roman chapter, Matthew chapter 27, verse 54, said, truly, this was the Son of God. For 50 days, those people have been crowded in Jerusalem. No one was arguing about the open tomb. See, no search party was sent. The apostles weren't questioned about the open tomb. The enemies knew. They knew about it even before the disciples did. The apostles fled. Basically, they missed it. The women in Matthew chapter 27, verse 55, they stayed. Yet they couldn't bear to watch, but yet they refused to leave. See, Christianity is built on the staggering and yet confusing empty tomb. The empty tomb is still empty this morning, or this evening. No tour guide, if you go to Jerusalem and visit the, the so-called Holy Land, no tour guide is going to tell you, if they get to the Jewish cemetery, they're going to say, well, this is the tomb where Jesus is buried. No. Here's the gravestone with his name on it. No, they don't say that. They say there's the empty tomb Jesus was raised from. See, after Pentecost, that empty tomb kind of goes into oblivion. You read Acts chapter 2. God appeared, the Holy Spirit appeared with a mighty wind. The Holy Spirit filled the apostles. Cloven tongues of fire appeared on their heads. And Peter preached about what happened 50 days ago. He said to his listeners that not only were they witnesses of it, many of them, but they were the perpetrators of it. He called them murderers. Murders of the Son of God. 
these godly people that had come to Jerusalem to worship God, he said, you're the ones that killed the son of God. And they heard that they were cut to their hearts. They cried out in horror, they repented. They said, what have we got to do? 3,000 were baptized that day for the remission of their sins. The church had its beginnings on that day in Jerusalem on Pentecost. History tells us that all the armies that ever marched, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned have not affected the world as much as one solitary life, the life of Jesus Christ. Those 3,000 baptisms were no accident. Satan wasn't quite as smart as he thought he was, was he? Now, don't underestimate say, Satan, but don't overestimate him either. Stop and think. Did he really think he could kill the Son of God? Surely, he knew that even if he did kill God, he couldn't keep God dead. You see, imagining that he won that day on those final hours on the cross, Satan had defeated himself. As you think about those Final three hours on the cross. Jesus is going to speak. You know, the interesting thing about the church is that was established on that day is the church is the only institution on earth that exists primarily for those who are not members of it. Think about that for just a moment. The church exists primarily for the benefit of those that are not even a member of it think about Jesus on the cross, Jesus didn't use his divinity to escape his humanity. Those final three hours on the cross were wrapped in a, an unreal and unnatural darkness. Quietness ruled. The only sounds you probably hear were the groans of three dying men and the dripping of blood perhaps into that dust. What a creepy day it must have been, that black day of darkness is. There's no world there. There's no bright. There's no brightness left. But then you think about grace in the gospel. See, grace is not something God forces on sinners. Grace is an area, a container, the contents of which are accepted by faith and then utilized. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 tells us. Grace is not mystical, but grace is historical. It's a historical God in time and it's planted on that cross. People of faith live in a sphere of grace. God's grace comes through our faith. In those final three hours on the cross, Jesus is going to make four statements in quick succession. The first one he says is found in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God can't touch sin, can't be around sin. But God made Jesus to be sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. This is the only time in all of history that God and Jesus are separated and were separated. How terrifying that is to think about. Oh, the depth of sin. Folks, don't minimize sin. Those near the cross, they thought Jesus was crying out for Elijah. You see, the separation from God was a deeper wound than any pain inflicted in Jesus on the cross. See, that statement, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That shouts out about the depth of man's fall, about how lost man was, and about the helplessness man was without Jesus Christ. See, Jesus' death not only conquered sin, but he conquered death. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Christians no longer have to fear death. Satan is and was a defeated enemy. Sin is a defeated curse. Death has lost its sting. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 26, and verses 51 to 58. Now, Jesus, knowing God's will was being done, he allowed himself to say in verse 28 of John chapter 19, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, 
the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Cheap wine was handy. Verse 29 says, now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it in hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Even when something decent was done for Jesus. There do you see this is a cheap act. His sixth statement. Humanity, one of our most basic instincts is not to want to be thirsty, to avoid thirst. Jesus here cries out for his humanity. The water of life himself was thirsty. John 6, 51 to 58. You remember that from? As a man, Jesus said, I thirst. Jesus was totally identified with humanity. He did not say, I hurt. He didn't say, I'm in pain. In fact, as we look back, we talked last week, the writers of this, the gospel, avoided talking in great detail about the pain, the agony on the cross. Because see, remember, we're not saved by his pain. We're saved by his blood, by his death. The Romans by this time had managed to make crucifixion an almost perfected horrible art. They knew how to kill a man while keeping him alive as long as possible. They knew how to humiliate a man and to make it as embarrassing, as degrading for a man as it could be. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14 says that, it prophesies there that he no longer even looked human. His visage had changed. It was in so much pain and so much agony and so much hurt on the cross that he didn't even look the same. See, the Jews had gone looking for the Messiah, but they rejected and crucified him when he came. What was their hope now in his death? Nothing can be more empty than a religion without a Messiah, without a Savior. See, God hasn't changed. God cannot change. God does not change. Jesus, the Messiah, came. Only then did he make that third statement of the cross in John 19 and verse 30. He said, it is finished. The task is done. God can be just while justifying sinners now jesus said this to let us know how little we understand it's just beyond our grasp heaven has to be eternal it will take us all eternity to grasp this in heaven we won't be god or gods as our mormon friends teach become that become a god heaven will be a as it's been described one of our heavens is going to be a continual learning experience. Being with God will further grasp his glory. Jesus will be there as the lamb, as the entire book of Revelation talks about and points to. All eternity will declare and celebrate it is finished. What man couldn't finish, Jesus did. The mouth of Satan, the accuser, Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, says it was shut. The old law of Moses was nailed to the cross. The new law of Christ came into effect. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13, and chapter 9, verses 12 through 18. Chapter 10 of Hebrews, verses 4 through 14, and chapter, four verses, uh, chapter 10, verses 18 through 31. The greatest mouthful ever spoken was when Jesus said at the completion, it is finished. Jesus made What's recorded is his last statement on the cross in a loud voice, Luke 23 and verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Isn't it amazing? Jesus would, would yell out at the top of his lungs. His crying out must have taken great effort, but he wanted all to hear this. Notice he didn't commend his body to God or his breath to God, he committed his spirit to God. Jesus, God's son, folks, he chose to die on the cross because he loved us. Jesus talked to us. He was on the cross and he was going to the cross. He never talked as much about being crucified as he did about being glorified. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with all the glory which I had with you
before the world was, John 17, verse 1 and verse 5. See, God turned the most inhumane instrument of torture, most inhumane form of putting a man to death, God turned that into his greatest motivation. The cross is the magnetism of God. Don't talk about God being within us or beside us until you grasp that God is above us. God has two thrones, folks. One is in the highest heaven, and the other is in our lowest heart. God wants you to understand Christ by understanding the cross. You don't understand Christ until you can understand the cross. The only person worthy of the glory gave it all to his father. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14 says, Christians aren't to glory in anything but the cross. Thank you for being with us tonight for our Bible class. I hope it's been meaningful to you. It's been something that's been uplifting to you, can encourage you. I want to remind you again about some of those that have a special interest in our prayers. Again, please remember Missy Breeden. Missy and Rick have got, their family have got some difficult times. She's got to heal up and then can start chemo again, and that's going to be a big challenge. We want to certainly remember her and keep her in our prayers as we think about those things. Also, Missy Webb, she fell a couple of days ago, still very, very sore having a lot of pain, has great difficulty in eating and in digesting food, not getting sick from that. What do you remember, Missy? She has a hard time all, almost all the time with that. Gaston Green, hopefully Gaston's getting a little better. Tried to get in touch with and speak with him this afternoon, and he's making some progress. John Mark is there with him, and we're thankful that his son's there with him, taking care of him, watching him for a week or so, giving him a chance to get himself back together and we're grateful for that and thankful for that also remember as always remember otelia she continues to have some issues with her back and in pain from that and some other struggles remember otelia and keep her in your prayers and your thoughts also buddy and sarita remember buddy and sarita they struggle on and continue to go on and buddy's able to drive around more now and get around more but still is always in a lot of pain i want to remember to keep him in our thoughts and our prayers as well well, that's all that we have. We want to remember them and keep, keep them in our prayers. I want you to remember all those that are suffering around the world today. It's in my morning devotions that we do each day at 7 o'clock, there's a number of folks from the Philippines. From, we've got watchers in Kenya. We've got them in Uganda. We've got them around the world that are in places, and they are suffering horribly about the afflictions brought on by this coronavirus and by the suffering that it brings many of them are concerned even about just having enough food to eat we've been able to do some things at trenton to help get some food to the philippines can't do for everybody but what a blessing it is to even though it's difficult we've got a number of our folks that are out of work now but thankfully we've got nobody that's out of food doesn't have food to eat doesn't have a place to stay and we're thankful for that but please remember those that are suffering even more than we are we, will, we ask you now to join us again. We'll be together every morning at 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. We have Don's daily devotionals, and I try to share some positive and uplifting thoughts with you on that. And I hope you'll take the time to tune in if you say 7 o'clock, so a little early for me. It is a little early for Jamie, too, so we don't, she doesn't usually watch it at 7, but you can watch it any time during the day. It's on my Facebook page, and then Matt puts it up on YouTube as well. You can go to there and find the quarantine devotionals, and you can find it there according to each day. Thank you for being with us. Let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together and Father, to discuss and to study together and to look at your cross, Father, and to look at the cross that means so much to us. And as we think about it, Father, we're grateful that it, it can truly draw us to you by drawing us to it, Father. We are realize the importance of it and the sacrifice that took place there and that father it should have been us suffering for all eternity but instead your son jesus came and suffered on the cross so that we would not have to die eternally we are grateful for that father we're thankful for this congregation here and all congregations around the world where people are watching tonight and sharing in this study together we pray that you'll be with them all father 
keep them all safe, Father, especially for those that we love and know that are in different places of the world that are, it's very, the suffering is much greater than it is here. We ask you to be with those in the Philippines and in Kenya and in Uganda and other places, Father, that are suffering great hardships tonight. We ask you to bless them and be with them. Father, be with us now and keep us safe. We're, Father, come to you once again on behalf of Missy. And Father, as she heals up and looks toward another round of chemo, pray that you'll give her strength to heal and she can go through the chemo and it can help to make her stronger and help her father to have her life improved and be back in more of a, the places she'd like to be, more with her family and more with the church, Father, and more serving you. We ask you to be with Gaston and Father, give him strength and help him to continue to recover. We're thankful for John Mark and his help for him. Father, we ask you to be with Mitzi and Father, she has so many struggles in her life. Be with her and give her strength, comfort, help her to make good decisions and to do things that would keep her as healthy as she can be. Help us, Father, to reach out to all of these, to Otelia, to Buddy and Sarita, to others, that, Father, that are shut in. We ask you to help us to be those that can reach out to them on the phone and make phone calls and contact them through text and, Father, to send cards and notes of encouragement to them to lift them up. Father, we give you the glory now for everything that we have in our lives, Father, and we are blessed again by the glory of the cross. We ask you now to be with us, keep us safe through the, the rest of the week. Pray, Father, those that are able to assemble can assemble on Sunday morning, and those that are not, Father, may this be something that can be uplifting to them and bring forward them. Father, we are grateful for this family, for its love for you, for its commitment to you, even these, in these difficult days. Keep us safe, keep us close to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for being here. Hope you've enjoyed it. It's meant something to you. God bless you, and we'll look forward to being back again with you soon.